welcome to Scientist Morning TV. Thank you for choosing to watch part two of our interview with Tom Nicholas and Galen Hall, two of the authors of the recent critique of deep adaptation. Now, in part one of the interview, Tom and Galen expressed concerns about the fact that very large claims about inevitable societal collapse were made on the basis of scant and at times inadequate evidence. And in a context where collapse itself was not defined, yet was implied to be apocalyptic. Now I'm talking to you a few days after the interview took place, at a point where a few more responses to the critique have come in. Many people have welcomed it and acknowledged that open and constructive engagement with the topic is helpful. Of course, that illuminates problems and shines a light on common ground, and it can help us reconcile seemingly conflicting views, and so doing, it moves the conversation forward. So in the second part of the interview, Tom and Galen talk about their experience of the initial and controversial claim made by deep adaptation, that we face inevitable near-term societal collapse. And they explain in further detail some of the ways in which they believe deep adaptation is problematic. Even if the kind of apocalyptic collapse that's envisioned by deep adaptation is not inevitable, I think there remains a question around whether or not the framework itself is causing harm to, to people. Um, and in this respect, I want to come back to Michael Mann, who, um, when I invited him to comment, said that when it comes to averting a climate crisis, there, there is great urgency, but there's also agency. The greatest obstacle standing in our way is the misguided and erroneous belief promoted by some that it's too late. Um, and previously, Jeremy Lent has, has, has also commented on deep adaptation, saying of, of Jem in particular here, if he chooses to go with his gut in instinct and conclude collapse is inevitable, he has every right to do so. But I believe it's irresponsible to package this as a scientifically valid conclusion and thereby criticize those who interpret the data otherwise as being in denial. Um, perhaps you'd like to comment on the potential as you see it and perhaps as you've had first-hand experience of of deep adaptation actually causing harm. Now, Galen, you, you, you alluded to this briefly early on, perhaps you'd like to say more about the potential of the framework for causing harm. Sure, yeah. I'll have to pick my words carefully here because I do, I want to acknowledge up front that um, as with anything, people respond differently to deep adaptation. So there are certainly, there are plenty of people who've read it, internalized the conclusions and then feel somehow better for it or even like on a spiritual level. And I don't think I think they're factually wrong, but I don't think their experience is invalid, which is a hard tension to live with, but I think it's right. Um, at the same time, there are plenty of people who internalize it and don't feel better. <laughs> so, um, and I was definitely one of those people. Um, we write a little bit in the piece about how there's a hem helpful simplification kind of that that deep adaptation and and even climate denial or other it's not limited to deep adaptation at all but it imposes a helpful simplification on the field of action so it sort of rules out a whole bunch of things that maybe we should be doing like different kinds of political engagement or what have you um, it says here's what's going to happen and here's what you got to do about it so it's got both an empirical an empirical claim that's wrong and some moral claims that um, you know, or depend on the empirical one. So there's sort of harm in that when it it can be it can definitely be psychological psychologically harmful to people. We cite a paper in the article that shows that those kinds of messages can rob people of their agency sometimes. That's not to say that they always do, but there's clear evidence that they sometimes do. Um, the other thing I want to mention briefly is as a different point. Um, there's also a problem of deep adaptation being a post-political way of viewing climate change. And I don't mean that in the way, in the sense that um, it takes no political position, but more in the sense that it ignores important political positions or obscures them. So once I kind of assume that society is going to collapse within the next decade, which is what the author has said publicly, um, that kind of wipes off the table any consideration of using working with social movements to leverage the state to do to make huge political or policy changes to address climate change because that state isn't going to be there those policy changes won't last 
Um, it also narrows the sort of set of people I consider myself to be working with or for to those people I can, who are close enough to me that we can literally survive societal collapse together. So I'm no longer going to give a shit about the people in southern U.S. who are already suffering like worse hurricanes each year with no federal aid coming for months. So their towns just stay basically flattened, right? I'm not going to care about that because that's too far away for me to do anything once society collapses. Um, that's a separate kind of harm, but I think it's related in the sense that once you lose agency by constricting the field of, of action, because of this assumption, the scientifically false assumption that society is going to collapse, um, then all these harms sort of come together. And maybe you feel okay about it, but you're definitely not acting the right way towards others if you believe that. I think that's, that's a very good point, yes. Um, Tom, would you like to comment at this point on the harm as, as you see it that deep adaptation may be causing? Yeah, well, I, I think that there's... There's a more prosaic form of harm in just rejecting scientific consensus um, in that we, the entire motivation for the climate movement is that these scientists have warned us that we need to do things differently. That's basically the underlying grounding principle. And if you then immediately dismiss those, then you really take away the foundational claim that motivates the movement. Um, and it become, you, you end up in a no man's land because you have these scientists who are fighting both denialism and catastrophism on both sides. And you really need the backing of these scientists because if you want to turn your social movement into further change, then at some point you're going to have to convince some people who are not part of that social movement and they're going to ask you what your evidence is and you're going to want to be able to point to those scientists and this this already matters for extinction rebellion like for example so one of our one of the people who contributed the piece and put his name on the piece james dyke actually gave expert test witness testimony at um some extinction rebellion activists trials and so if we reject the science in that sense we lose this kind of like actual strategic um support as well i'm not sure if that's quite what you were asking but no thank no 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 thank you i think i think that's a good point um and in a sense what deep adaptation is, is now doing because people are questioning questioning it is is showing sort of fault lines if you like within within extinction rebellion as a movement um so i know for example in your in your article you talk about some people giving um alluding to some some pseudoscience as a justification for for an action um which which is not what, what at all what what um what you would wish to find um i wondered if you'd like to comment on um the reactions or the uh, the response that was was made by jem bandel posting not not directly to you because i don't believe that he contacted you directly but he posted um a response on his website um well i think one thing that you briefly mentioned is that he points back to a discussion of some criticism gavin schmidt made but we looked at that in detail and it's really, we, lift, we list those five techniques of science denial and really that response displays all of them again. Um, and you can see that although there's a very small like moderation accepted in those responses, it doesn't go anywhere near as far as is necessary to actually become in line with what there is direct evidence for. Um, so there's a problem there, at least, because there isn't, there isn't really a serious um, discussion of 90% of our piece, which was a discussion of the science. Yeah, I would just add to that. I mean, I think I want to reinforce, actually, something maybe we should have said earlier, which is that, like, Tom and I and Colleen, we're not, well, we're not even climate scientists. The climate science, we know the climate science in our article is robust because we've consulted with so many climate scientists who we were lucky enough to know in writing it. We're definitely not movement activist experts. We're, we participate in movements and we do actions and stuff, but we're not like experts on that. And we're not psychologists. So we can't arbitrate all the different 
um, backlash along like psychological grounds or along like movement strategy grounds um, completely. And maybe there were some valid points made in that rebuttal. I didn't, I did feel like it didn't feel particularly constructive to me. Um, but I definitely, like I said, I don't think we can judge the experience of people in the deep adaptation forums and the deep adaptation groups and what have you, like it might be working out well for them. But the main thing is that the response just does not address any of the claims about the science, which are integral to all the rest of the claims underlying deep adaptation. And the one point in the response that's supposed to address those claims, like Tom just said, um, is really a weakly argued set of responses to these comments Gavin Schmidt made on, on the deep adaptation paper a while ago. We address all those in our paper. We read that in depth. Um, some of the same fallacies about nonlinearity are made in that response. Um, some of the same cherry picking of sources and so on. So I think at the end of the day, there might be helpful deep adaptation trainings that people do that actually, you know, I deeply believe, I don't think we're gonna hit, I don't think we're gonna stay below two degrees Celsius and there are things you have to accept if you believe that. And so the deep adaptation forums might help people accept those things, but they're just wrong on the science. And they're like so deeply disastrously wrong that it's dang It's strategically and psychologically dangerous for, for some people. And that part was just not addressed robustly in this response or in any of the previous responses, because it can't be because uh, it's wrong. So. Thank you. Another observation that, that others have made, and, and I notice it too, is that there, in, in looking at the responses to critiques of deep adaptation, there's almost a sense in which the reader comes away feeling that um, if I'm not doing or experiencing grief or doing despair in the way that deep adaptation prescribes, I'm not doing it right. And in a sense, Unwittingly, I'm sure it, it does invalidate the responses of individuals like like myself, perhaps like like you, perhaps like others, and people who who don't want to embrace who do, who aren't collapsologists, who don't want to embrace the, the the notion of collapse being inevitable, and people who do value their sense of agency, um, and people who do want to hang on to a kind of hope, be that an active hope or a different kind of hope. Um, I, I, I've, um, I observed um, a recording by Andrew Samuels, who's a psychotherapist um, with some expertise in, in um, or some understanding of um, eco-anxiety and, and climate science. And he talks about the fact that to, for us to have hope means that we have to be prepared to take risks and therefore we have to uh, mobilise our sense of agency. Um, and I think it's a very good point. Another point he makes, which I think is really very pertinent too, is that he feels that there's um, a possibility that we are in, in love with apocalyptic thinking, that we find it very seductive, particularly in these times, um, and that the, the basis or the root of that, that he calls it an addiction to apocalyptic thinking, is a profound feeling of guilt. And so it's entirely possible, I think, that there's some confusion, if you like, between sort of subjective experiences within deep adaptation and the, the objective reality. Um, I think the Open Democracy paper ends on a, on a really interesting point, um, Galen, which I wonder if you would like to, to talk through um, with the ambrosia and nectar. I'm sure you can, I'm sure you can express it far better than I, than I ever could. But I think it's, it, it really crystallizes the I think some of the key points that your paper makes. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so the open democracy piece ends on a, I guess you could call it like a vignette or something um, about the Greek goddess Persephone who is abducted by Hades, the god of the underworld. Um, and we kind of, we did an alteration of the original myth uh, to, to fit kind of the feeling we wanted to get across. And in the alteration, Persephone is basically starved out by Hades because she has to eat the food of the underworld in order to be trapped there. Um, and so when she finally can't resist any longer, Hades gives her three options. And uh, 
on the, I forget how it was set up, but there's the ambrosia, which is sort of, um, which I'm going to get the ambrosia and the nectar mixed up probably. So forgive me. But so there's the ambrosia, which is sort of um, allows you to completely let go of the world above the world of the living and um, sort of gives you a sort of sweet despair into which you can sink and accept your life in the underworld. There's the nectar, which makes you um, resent the world of the living. And then out of that hatred, you want to stay in the underworld, right? And then there's the pomegranate, which is what she actually ate in the original myth, um, which makes you resent the world of the underworld. And like you understand that you're trapped there, but you want to get back and you want to do everything you can, even if it's painful to hold that hope in your mind. Um, I'm probably butchering the metaphor that I wrote, so please, like, any, anyone who watches this, <laughs> check out the original article. But the point just is that um, there's an attractive, yeah, there's an, I'm sure we do have an addiction to apocalypse. Part of that has to do with guilt. I think that's a really interesting point that I, I don't know how to unpack further, but I think bears further discussion. But also there's just an addiction to certainty, and there are different ways that we give ourselves certainty. So on the one hand, there's a certain kind of certainty in feeling that we have to work within established channels to make change. So I'm just going to putter along in my, um, you know, corporate sustainability work or my NGO or something like that. And I don't think that those are effect. I don't think that those established channels of change are effective. We kind of tried to show that in the show that was our opinion in the piece. Um, and there are plenty of people who can make that case far better than us. And then there's also, okay, none of this is working. We have to just accept that it will never work. That's a, that is a huge amount of certainty, actually. I mean, that's like a radically certain position to take, right? Like you're ridiculously certain about what the future is going to hold if you believe that. But it makes things a lot simpler as well. And then there's the um, things will probably be really bad. I'm not really looking forward to some of the things in my own future or in other people's future. But at the same time, I know they're not certain and there's, I know there's room for change, even if it's vague. And I have to work with that, even if it's un, like psychologically unpleasant in the day to day. Um, and that is the choice that we are trying to get across with that ending metaphor. And we think, to us at least, that was, it was sort of that certainty that, or at least to me, that it was that certainty that was one of the key attractions of deep adaptation in the first place. But it just seems, um, for lots of reasons, seems wrong to accept. So okay. one, just to add to that, sorry. Um, I think that it's quite important to emphasize that one of the, the reason we ended with that was because we were trying to make it clear that we were not pitching hope in total opposition to deep adaptations despair. That was not the line that we were trying to go down. The entire point was that deep adaptation does not have a monopoly on grief and that one can simultaneously be very, very sad about what we know is going to happen and what is already happening, whilst still understanding that um, there is capacity to lessen future damages. We still have the capacity to change a large portion of a future trajectory and that we have a duty not to abandon that idea too early and that deep adaptation is... Um, as Galen says, it's ambrosia because it invites you through the mechanism of misleading science to abandon your position far too early. Um, Thank you. So, which relates back to the response that um, the characterizes our piece as peddling hopium, I think was the phrase, but that's just, that's not what we were trying to get at at all. Thank you. Yes, I think I think you put it very well. Um, and I think if there was to be an, a, a, an appeal to the deep adaptation movement, then then for my part, I think it would be to to stop in invalidating alternative responses and, and the other kinds of reactions that people might have um, and to stop casting them as denial. Um, and to ac accept that these are real and these are just as valid. Yeah, I think in the response to the article, we have seen some invalidation of different kinds of 
emotional responses to climate change. So it's like, if you're not totally relinquishing your hope for some kind of like vaguely modern future, <laughs> um, then you're, then you're like your emotional response is invalid. And I think that kind of response is just, I mean, we kind of just ignore it in public and it's just not very helpful, but I think it is born out of a defensiveness because once I get wrapped up in the deep adaptation philosophy with both the empirical claims and all the sort of spiritual emotional work as well, um, I can imagine feeling like, okay, if I actually let, if I acknowledge how wrong the science is and I have to let go of all this work that's been helpful for me dealing with some very valid grief and that grief that we still feel, I mean, I still feel a lot of grief thinking about the past and the future for myself and for other people. Um, but you can actually still have that grief and just not take on board the flawed certainty inherent in the, the scientific claims. And it's harder to, I think it's definitely harder to do that. I don't think I necessarily know how to do that very well, but I think it's possible. And if <laughs> I don't know if anyone who's already totally on board with deep adaptation will listen to anything that we say, <laughs> doesn't seem like it. But that's like the one thing that I would say is that you can have the grief, you can have the acceptance, but also understand that your capacity for action is not limited in the way you think it is. Thank you. Very well put, I think. Um, Tom, would, uh, for a, a, final, a final comment from you? I would... S Rejecting the idea that collapse is inevitable does not exclude very radical responses to it, right? So one of the things that I think is the strength of Extinction Rebellion is that it's openly willing to consider uh, systems change or um, very widespread changes to values and how we run things and how we structure our systems. And one of deep adaptations strengths is that it criticizes previous approaches for being limited right it criticizes neoliberalism it criticizes personal carbon footprinting and that kind of thing um but if you re you can reject deep adaptation without limiting yourself to only very very conventional approaches to dealing with climate change right and this is reflected in one of the contributors and authors is Julia Steinberger and she's an economist but she's specifically like an anti-capitalist economist ecological economist who cannot be described as a centrist um, and so what she represents is a radical but rational approach and one of the problems with deep adaptation is it casts anyone who thinks that there is still a approach that can help as not being radical when we can see that that's not true because here's a counter example very good point thank you well and a good point to end on so thank you so much for your time um once again i, I admire your your courage in um you know being so career young and in writing such an important piece many people have said that it was you know that they've been waiting for a critique of the framework for some time so and they've you know very much welcomed your your work so thank you thank you so much thank you thank you it's been great to be on here thank you for watching it is fair and appropriate to critique deep adaptation many have argued that a belief in the inevitability of collapse just is categorically wrong and there are clearly problems with the science presented problems that simply can't be downplayed by simple edit or frequent appeals to misrepresentation. I'll end by repeating some of the points others such as Jeremy Lent have made so well. It's not fair to disparage those of us who are driven by hope and who wish to do what we can to protect life on our beautiful planet. And hope is not a dirty word, and it is not necessarily about the future. It is in fact a state of mind, and it does require courage. So it is demeaning to dismiss those who express hope and who choose to act on their hope as individuals who are somehow in denial or failing to see a great truth. Equally, it's wrong to attack those who choose to express hope and who do not wish to engage with deep adaptation or have chosen to leave it behind. 
Hope and despair are equally valid responses to our predicament and they should not be weaponized. In my next interview, I'll be talking with Professor Julia Steinberger, mentioned in this interview. Julia is an ecological economist and anti-capitalist. Thank you so much for watching and please feel free to like, comment and share this video and subscribe to our channel for news of our next video. Thank you.